Hello, and welcome to today's information session about the master's degree fields in government, international relations, and history. We are grateful that you're considering studying with us, and we look forward to sharing a bit of information about these three degree fields with you here today. Uh, just to note that we are recording today's webinar, and we'll follow up via email with a captioned recording, as well as a link to these slides in a couple of days. We'll also be recording or we'll also be posting this recording on the Harvard Extension School's YouTube channel. So let's run through the agenda for today's event. We're gonna provide an overview of the Master of Liberal Arts degree in these three social science fields. We will also walk you through, through the degree program pathway from admissions all the way through to thesis and capstone projects. We'll explore each of the three program areas in depth a little bit more, discussing coursework, thesis and capstone projects, and alumni outcomes. And we'll provide an overview of the admissions process and how you can get started. We'll also take time for a couple of questions and provide some contact information at the end of this webinar so that you can reach out and get your questions answered. Now, I would love to introduce my colleagues who are here to present information to you today. They work with students very closely on a regular basis, and I'm happy to introduce each of them. We have Dr. Stephen Shoemaker, who is the director of our Master of Liberal Arts programs here at Harvard Extension School. We have the three research advisors for these fields who teach core courses in each of these programs and guide you through thesis and capstone projects and research. It's Michael Miner, Doug Bond, and Arian Liezos. We also have Allison Bogus, who is a pre-degree and admissions advisor here at Harvard Extension School. And with that, those introductions, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Dr. Shoemaker, who will get us started. Stephen? Well, hello. Uh, welcome to you as you contemplate uh, pursuing studies with us in the Master of Liberal Arts program. Uh, we've got a slide that describes our uh, student body mix. So uh, if we could move to that next, we have in the social sciences, a variety of non-traditional students. So our average age is 35 years old. Uh, these are folks who are either thinking of changing careers or advancing their career. Uh, you can see that typically they have a depth of professional experience and the addition of not only coursework, but potentially a, a relevant and meaningful academic credential is something that they're seeking out while working full time. I know that that can be a daunting prospect to you. Uh, the idea of taking on a full time master's program is not a fit for people who are typically working full time but we've designed a program uh, that does meet those needs. And typically it's about four and a half uh, years if you decide to pursue a degree for us. I do want to say that we offer a variety of levels of engagement, which is uh, one of the hallmarks of our program. So you can sample a course uh, with us without having to apply and have admission. Uh, if you decide that this is something that's productive and useful to you, you can then pursue a certificate. So on our home web page, if you go to the left column under academics and choose certificates, you can see our stackable certificates that are offered there, meaning that you can work toward the certificate and then those courses would apply toward a degree if that is something you uh, decide that you want to pursue with us. I want to look at the next slide where we'll talk a little bit about the, the process for people who do decide that the, the pursuit of the master's degree is their goal. The, uh, there are structures in place for gaining admissions. So unlike a traditional master's program where you would take your GRE exam and submit an application in advance, uh, we have what's called an earn your way in process. So you take three courses for admission, one of which is your pro seminar relevant in your field, and then uh, two courses within the field that you select, and you earn a B or above in those courses uh, to demonstrate your ability to undertake uh, scholarly work in your area of specialization, and then you're able to apply for degree candidacy. When you uh, do apply for degree candidacy, you need to think through how it is you want to meet the requirement 
uh, at the end of the program. So you can either write a thesis, which is an independent project working one-on-one -on -one with a thesis director, typically a member of Harvard's faculty, who will guide you through a process of nine to 12 months in producing a document, typically between 50 and 100 pages in length, an opportunity for you to engage in uh, in-depth research in a topic that's meaningful to you. We also offer capstone opportunities, which is uh, more of a, a seminar course format where you come on a weekly basis and meet with your peers and the instructor of the capstone, and uh, you can uh, develop an independent project during that capstone year. The, uh, the capstones are described on our website, uh, the various options that are relevant to the fields in the social sciences. I would recommend strongly that along the way you take advantage of the advising that we offer for uh, our students and degree candidates. So before uh, you're working your way toward admission, you have an admission advisor that you'll be working with. And then later you'll be handed to an academic advisor who will work with you in your area of specialization. And if you are choosing to write a thesis, you'll uh, ultimately work with a research advisor who will help you generate your thesis topic, develop an argument, make you, uh, help you to work through the familiarity with the relevant literature and so forth, and ultimately producing your thesis proposal in a tutorial course we have for that, and as well as uh, the thesis itself. All of these uh, are described on our website in a page called the thesis process, should you choose the thesis option rather than the, uh, the capstone option. We also have a variety of components to the degree that are described on the website. There's the uh, residency component. Uh, this is an on-campus experience for three of your courses. This can be accomplished either through the 15-week fall or spring course. We, uh, that would meet on campus each week, or we have courses that have intensive weekends. We also offer three-week classes in January uh, or three and seven-week classes in the summer, all of which can be done in person to accomplish your, uh, your residency requirements. So that gives you a little bit of an overview for uh, the program and the flexible ways that you can encounter us through taking a course, through uh, uh, accomplishing the requirements for a certificate or stacking that certificate toward a graduate degree. We're going to hear more in detail now from our three research advisors who work with students in government, IR, and international relations and history. Uh, they're all social science um, academics. So while they have an area of specialization in each of those fields, there's a little bit of flexibility in terms of who students may work with, depending on the details of the project that they're undertaking. But generally speaking, they're responsible for certain rubrics, either government history or international relations, as they'll describe today. But I don't want you to feel like uh, there's an absolutely rigid structure in place, because indeed, uh, students may be working with one or another of these research advisors, depending on the particular nature of their project. And I think first we're going to hear from uh, Mike Miner, who uh, works in uh, government primarily, but not exclusively. And we'll move to the next slide for Mike. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, and it's great to see all of you here uh, today. Uh, and I really appreciate your interest in this and talking about government or what I think some of you may be familiar with another term for government uh, in academia uh, is political science. Uh, within government, you'll find classes on American politics, political theory, uh, comparative politics, political economy, and indeed some international relations, which Dr. Bond will talk about more in just a few minutes. Uh, students explore domestic and foreign topics uh, that affect how we organize ourselves uh, as a society. So for example, in if you're studying uh, U.S. government specifically, because that's a point of interest for you in your studies. We have a number of courses that look at the inner workings of government, including the presidency, Congress, or even matters related to state or local issues. You might examine uh, key policy challenges from education to health insurance, voting rights, constitutional law, the environment, or the politics of the White House and Washington. Uh, it's never a dull conversation, that's for sure. In foreign policy classes, which you'll find under government as well as international relations, 
this is a space that grapples with how states or countries operate within what we know as the international system. So how do governments and leaders make decisions that affect the interests of a country? What are questions about war and peace that they have to think about? Does this sound familiar to any of you uh, keeping track of the news in the last couple of weeks? Uh, courses look at topical issues, different regions of the world, and some include historical uh, and contemporary challenges as well. When it comes to other topics within the government uh, concentration, you'll also see the civil rights movement as an example of a course. So understanding where we are as a country by exploring where we've been uh, and perhaps where we're going. Uh, a deeper dive into the history of our politics and society, uh, social justice, and how has the civil rights movement shaped our national conversation and discourse today. On a very interesting sort of set of courses uh, that address the core concept of strategy or grand strategy, imagine you're working for the president on the National Security Council and you're grappling with a major crisis. What to do? Classes on strategy, intelligence, and international security put you in the shoes of someone working for the president or supporting a key decision maker, just like the NSC and wider government. Uh, as Dr. Shoemaker alluded to uh, or talked about in depth, there are, of course, thesis and capstone options for government. Uh, you'll see uh, deliberative justice, national security writing and analysis, and policy writing and analysis. Uh, for the capstone options. Uh, some of the project examples you'll see explore issues both domestic and foreign in nature. And I think what you'll find is that there's a good opportunity within the capstone space to take a deep dive on a topic or issue that you find particularly interesting, be it a personal interest, professional interest, or just something new that you've wanted to look at a bit more in detail. Uh, so Capstone offers a good structured environment where you have cohorts and a class-like structure every week, and you work on this over the course of two semesters. For the thesis, uh, one question we often get is, will this prepare me for further study in a PhD class or uh, perhaps law school or medical school or something a little more um, that next level of scholarship? And the answer for that is I tell my students is, if you're interested in that, a thesis is a very good way to go about and see if this is something that you're interested in doing further. It's a great opportunity to dive in with a thesis director one on one and really start to understand what does that next level of scholarship take and uh, I have seen just phenomenal experiences uh, for students here in that space. Uh, and we'll go to the next slide now to take a look at what are some of the government outcomes for students that have gone on through this program graduated and what have they done afterwards. Uh, I've seen uh, a wide array of different areas of profession and work, from a mayor to consultants or activists in different spaces. Uh, we have a lot of military students in the space, as you can imagine. Indeed, we have students that are often overseas when they take a class or two here in the program. Uh, we have directors of policy and research who support members of Congress or think tanks, or perhaps even the president, uh, along with intelligence analysts. And indeed, we've actually had members of Congress graduate from this program to go on and serve on Capitol Hill. Uh, you'll see, for example, employers, State Department, or if you're in the UK or elsewhere, sometimes that's called Foreign Office, uh, the White House, Congress itself, and indeed the military. In fact, I want to tell one quick little story about uh, a former student we had uh, in this uh, program. Uh, they took a course uh, on net grand strategy and national security decision making. And in that class, we looked at how do you write a good policy memo for a key decision maker in government. And indeed, it was on January 20th, uh, 2017. Uh, I got a call from a student that afternoon, and they said, uh, Dr. Miner, I just wanted to call and thank you uh, for teaching me how to write in this space. Uh, I am leaving Washington because I have left my job at the White House of the last administration. And he told me, he said, well, uh, I know the president read it. I don't know what came of it, but I wanted to thank you for teaching us how to write in this type of space. And that's something we strive to do is to give you the tools and the capabilities to apply what you learn uh, in a very real way. Uh, and I'm going to turn now to uh, Dr. Bond, who's going to talk a little bit more about uh, international relations and working in that foreign policy space. 
Over to you, Doug. Thank you, Mike. And I too am honored to be talking with you, those of you who are interested in pursuing perhaps a degree in international relations in that concentration. And I, I first want to start out by saying, what is international relations? How is it different from government? And um, for me, international relations is that you're studying political processes, just like government concentration. You're especially looking at governance issues, but more generally power, how power is wielded and uh, the outcomes, whether it's conflict or peace. And the distinctive part of international relations typically is that it, these issues that are of focus, are they transcend a given government or a single government, but they could focus, many of our students focus on one country. Uh, so that's still possible, but it's typically not the US because I think Dr. Miner covered that pretty well in his presentation. So that's the focus on governance, power, in, uh, war and peace and so forth, and political processes more generally. But what, who, you know, what are the subject matter? The subject matter literally range from economics to culture to diplomacy um, and everything in between. And so it's a wide ranging um, scope of investigation. And so, the, but the four dominant ones are international security with issues of war and peace, political economy, and that encompasses trade, finance, and development, international organizations and law, which is uh, an established subfield. And finally, some students pursue um, a methodology um, focus. And when I say that, I don't mean statistics or numbers, I mean methodology, a tool to investigate a particular question that is being uh, assessed. So if you, uh, I would say half of the international relations students don't have any numbers per se, in, you know, no statistics, I should say, in their thesis. So don't be afraid of, of that aspect of that methodology. There are plenty of methods in the toolbox. And I think um, this is one issue that many people have to learn about before they can be comfortable with. The kind of thesis uh, is just eclectic and it's wide ranging, but before you get to the thesis, you have some core courses and there we have the academic advisors to provide you with guidance, how to make sure all of the requirements are met. But beyond that, there's a whole bunch of courses, the whole, you know, it's wide open as exemplified in the thesis. And for example, corporate social responsibility. It transcends any given uh, country. Uh, peacekeeping, and uh, I had a student recently in the military who studied peacekeeping operations in Africa. Um, and we also had a student, uh, believe it or not, who studied happiness. And that may seem a little bit odd for international relations, but what she did was go to Uganda and sit in a very small village with a group of local women and tried to understand why they were so happy. And they were happy, they were impoverished, but they had a community and they were contributing to their family and they were making some kind of a widget for a factory. And they, they assembled these widgets and gave it to the, you know, sold it to the factory. And she, under, she tried to understand that concept of happy that is certainly not based on wealth or opportunity alone because the, this community was quite happy and she employed uh, issues of gender in that study as well. Um, another student looking at film, again, you may not think it's obvious for international relations. She took a recently produced, and this is about five years ago, an indie film where a woman in a country, Ethiopia, was accused for killing her husband. Now this was an arranged marriage and the husband has actually abducted her, her future husband actually abducted her, carried her off. And in that process, she killed him. And this was an actual true story that got made into a film. And what she did was examine that film and she, she looked at and actually interviewed the protagonist, the defense attorney in that case. And she invited that attorney to the US onto Harvard campus and had a film showing 
a debut of that film in the United States. And that protagonist today happens to be the Supreme Court Justice in Ethiopia. And so you can see how much interaction you can have with a little bit of creativity. Uh, another one, reoccurring signals of crises. You, you know, we go through these economic cycles every seven to 10 to 15 years. One student took the long view and looked at macro cycles over hundreds of years. We also had one uh, looking at the Pacific War decisions, uh, specifically involving Japan. She was an expert on Japanese um, language and she literally dissected the decisions that were made that brought us to the war. Another one was done by a student who looked at Vietnamese refugees 30 years on and how if there were any infractions um, in their normal day, for instance, um, they got into an altercation on the street or something, they could in fact become stateless despite the fact that in the 70s the U.S. Uh, gave them their statehood in here because of the fact that they were refugees. So she examined this loophole in the law that allowed us, their only country they knew, these are kids coming over at four, five, six, seven years old, to then be stateless after 30 or 40 years simply because of an infraction. And it was a very touching one. Um, on the other end, uh, one student looked at the policy for, of the US primarily for going to the moon or Mars. It was about eight years back and we were deciding where to put our resources. And she interviewed virtually everybody that was making those decisions. And finally, um, future of Taiwan Straits is another one, uh, which is another hot topic today. And a lot of work goes on gender, especially in the developing world. Um, and uh, we have, uh, theses to do that. Now, on the capstone side, I just want to highlight one in particular. Uh, this is not under international relations, but I think it's relevant to international relations, and it's called social justice or bridges to uh, just peace. And this is uh, led um, by a by an instructor from the Div School, and who tries to uh, make the opportunity for students to come together together to formulate plans for bridges. How do we get from a very unjust, very conflictual situation into a just peace? And most of these outcomes are developed by students themselves. They formulate, you know, within broad, out, uh, broad scope, they formulate their own um, foci for these. And if you could turn to the next one, please. The next slide. And I want to just mention similar to the government concentration at all levels and at all topics, you have people, and the only addition to the government list is it's not restricted to the US typically. So literally you have people from think tanks to inter intergovernmental associations to corporations, transnational, and even down to the local agency. So it's wide open. And uh, as Dr. Miner had said, it's wonderful foundation for, for continuing on. And I believe the latest numbers that I've seen are that roughly 10% go on uh, to actual doctoral programs after this. And they do it within a specialty that they've been well prepared for. And if they've taken the thesis class, they, they thesis route, they've actually produced something on their own, very similar to a doctoral thesis, uh, dissertation. And I think I'll leave it there and ask Dr. Leazos to talk about history. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. I too want to say how happy I am to have this opportunity to talk about our wonderful and diverse students. Um, and I think I'll start off by explaining a little bit of how histories may be different than the other two. Because while we certainly have many students who are very interested in the issues uh, that Drs. Bond and Dr. Meyer Miner talked about, um, political topics in particular, we have the range of history as well. So we have people who do social history, cultural history, um, intellectual history, who use very sort of different methodologies. Um, and I thought I would begin um, by highlighting some of the courses that we have that cover these methodological ranges 
but also different parts of the world. So certainly I would say our most common and most popular courses are in US and European history. Um, but we also have um, courses in Latin American history, Asian history, African history as well. Um, this semester is a sort of sampling that show both the methodological and geographic range. I thought I'd read a few course titles. Um, there's a course called Riots, Strikes, and Conspiracies in American History, which is very popular. Um, but we also have a history of imperialism in North Africa. Um, we have a cultural course that talks about the crown, analyzing British history from Edward VII through to Elizabeth II through television and film. So you can sort of see some of these courses are focused on social movements and politics. Others are sort of more cultural as well. Um, another course we have that's extremely popular focuses on US-China relations, um, opium war to the present. And so while we obviously are going much further back into the past, you can see some of the similarities and overlap with government and international relations and that our history courses are also very much related to topics of interest in current events today in the United States. Um, the students who come to us to study history are sometimes also from uh, different backgrounds and come to us for different purposes. I would say that broadly speaking, the two main categories we have would be um, current high school history teachers. We have many of those who, um, teachers who currently have a bachelor's degree but are pursuing a master's degree, both um, for their own enrichment and to improve their teaching and also because it can provide a higher salary as a high school history teacher. Um, and then we have another category of people who've pursued careers in different paths for financial or other personal reasons. We have lawyers, we have people in finance, um, we have people in computer programming um, whose passion always was history and it's something they've loved for decades and studied on the side for decades on their own. And for whatever reason, they're at a point in their life where they can come back and decide they want to devote more study and more time to history. Um, and so we have a lot of students who have come to us later in their lives. Um, some of them are interested just for personal enrichment, um, and they're just doing it for the pure passion for history. And others are considering a career change. Maybe they've worked in finance for 10 years or so, and now they're thinking of possibly going to graduate school and getting a PhD. And our program provides a great opportunity to sort of go back, do some more coursework in preparation. Um, and as some of the others have highlighted, that opportunity to do a thesis can be a great kind of way to see if this really is a good fit for you. Um, graduate programs in history are very much looking to see your ability to conduct independent and in-depth primary research. And so the thesis process is a great way to demonstrate that if you're applying to a doctoral program. So we see a lot of that. Um, what I wanted to do now is maybe talk a little bit about some of the recent um, theses, theses that we have that really can help sort of illustrate the range of opportunities that we have for students. Um, and you can see from the list of sample thesis titles just how diverse they are uh, in lots of ways. So the first one um, is a wonderful thesis that was, I believe it was last year, the student graduated. Um, it's on Henry Cabot Lodge and um, Kennedy and the escalation of the war in Vietnam. And so this is in some ways um, a more traditional focus on political elites, a sort of biographical approach. Um, it was directed by a Pulitzer Prize winning historian here at Harvard named Frederick Lodgeval, um, really just sort of wonderful and in-depth style um, of that sort of political history. Um, but then we also have people who are not interested and, and want to sort of focus on a different style and a different approach. Um, so we have um, the second one that I have listed here is actually on ancient Rome. Um, this student uh, is currently finishing up his thesis right now, um, and he's interested in economic history, um, and he's interested in the economics of how Rome financed the empire. Um, and he is one of our students who came to us later in life. I think he's probably in his 70s um, with a passion for history and had had another master's degree in Latin and is now actually working with the dean of the graduate school on this thesis and really just doing some wonderful research and uncovering all sorts of fascinating things. Um, the next one we have is a thesis that looks at um, a British um, intellectual, Bertrand Russell, and his travels to China um, in 1920. And so focusing on um, and based on both English language documents and Chinese documents. Um, I won't go over 
all of them, but I do just want to highlight in general that we, we do have a range of style, um, a range of methods. One thing that I do encourage students to keep in mind is um, the ability to travel. We have students who want to go to archives um, throughout the world as part of the research, but we also increasingly in the historical profession ha are privileged to live in a moment where so much has been digitized and there's lots of primary sources available online. So we have many students who write their entire history thesis from their own home and they don't have to travel to different places throughout the country. Um, and so I think it's important to keep that in mind as well. Um, I want to actually highlight one other point, if I may. Actually, you can go to the next slide, if you would. Um, what are some of the outcomes? I talked a little bit about that earlier and mentioning that you know we do have students who want to go on, who are currently high school history teachers who are just sort of getting this for their own enrichment. Um, we do have people who go on to graduate programs. We have people who are sort of working independently. We, many of our theses in history are actually published. I would say the history theses sometimes run long. Um, the range is 50 to 100 pages officially, but we've had um, theses that run over. And so some of those that run over um, tend to be published as books. So we've had some wonderful books in recent years. Um, and I thought I would highlight the first one. This is a student who just emailed me last week. Um, the Forgotten Chinese of the Napa Valley. And so this is another gentleman who had a career as a computer programmer, always had a passion for history, lives in the Napa area, and discovered that uh, while there's a lot that's been written on Chinese immigrants in San Francisco um, and some of the other cities in California, um, the history of this group of immigrants in a rural area in Napa had never been written before. And he discovered this um, by visiting local wineries and talking to people. And he found archival collections that nobody had ever looked at before and was able to produce a really original, fascinating, and wonderful piece of history that's going to be published next year. Um, and he's going to be even doing a sort of local speaking tour in the area going around presenting the book um, in various venues. So we have a wide range of opportunities and topics. Um, I see a question in the chat for me that I want to make sure I don't forget to answer. Um, oh, yes, somebody asked if we have African-American history, and is that a focus area? And it most definitely is. Um, we have many students who do wonderful projects on African-American history. I can actually tell you two students who are currently working on their thesis proposals with me now are writing both on really important and fascinating topics. There's one student who's interested in the history of Juneteenth um, and is going to be writing a history of Juneteenth in uh, Texas in particular. And she's going to look at some of the early celebrations of Juneteenth. Um, she's working with some of the slave narratives. Um, I'm working with her to find local newspapers that she can document to understand the early history of this holiday and how it was celebrated in Texas. Um, and then there's another student who's interested in a topic that's very popular these days, which is to look at the relationship between slavery and universities. Um, there's been a lot, even here at Harvard this year, there's a, a series of workshops on Harvard's relationship to slavery, and she's interested in the relationship of slavery to uh, Sweetbriar College, which was actually a plantation before it became a college. And so she's going to be doing research at Sweetbriar, which is her undergraduate alma mater as well. So we definitely have, I would say, within American history, um, 20th century political and social history, um, African American history um, are some of our most popular topics. Um, I think let me see. Um, somebody asked about uh, Ottoman history. Yes, I actually have somebody doing a, a thesis on Ottoman history at the moment. He's interested in the language reform movement um, that starts with the new state, uh, the Republic in the early 20th century. And he's looking, um, he's fluent in three languages. So he's going to be looking at it through Turkish, German, and French history, um, looking at a kind of international discussion about language reform and how it relates to politics and nationalism. So. Um, I would just, I'll wrap up because I know we have others who want to talk, but uh, please do feel free to contact me down the line if you have specific questions about other courses and thesis topics um, that I can discuss. I know that I didn't cover the capstones as much, and I believe Dr. Shoemaker was going to mention that since he actually teaches one of our capstones. Um, Ariane, maybe we'll just move on to um, Alice's oh, section sure. about admissions. Sure. No problem, we can do that. Pardon okay. me. All right, thank you. Um, so hi, I'm Alison Bogus. Um, I'm a pre-degree and admissions advisor here at Harvard Extension School. I'm going to spend just a few minutes discussing the admission requirements specific to the international relations, government, and history fields of the ALM degree program. 
So Harvard Extension School has what we call an earn your way in admissions process. Uh, for the international relations, government and history fields, we require the completion of three courses uh, for admission with grades of B or higher and a formal application. Of note, the government field specifically has an alternative pathway to admission for those who have completed the public leadership credential through the Harvard Kennedy School. Students wishing to pursue this alternative pathway to admission to the government ALM would need to earn the public leadership credential first, take the pro seminar, and then submit a formal application. Each of our degrees has a uh, degree requirements page, which will list the courses required for admission. Uh, you will need to earn a grade of B or higher in each of these admission courses, then you should submit your application while completing your last course for admission. I also want to stress again that it is important to read the degree requirements page thoroughly because some fields do have additional admissions criteria and all fields have a specific set of required courses and number of courses which need to be taken in residence, among other requirements. Okay, next slide please. Thank you. Um, prior to working toward admission to our graduate program, you must have completed a regionally accredited U.S. bachelor's degree or its foreign equivalent, uh, which was conferred before starting your graduate coursework at Harvard Extension School. Additionally, you cannot already have a previously completed graduate degree in a related field. The Office of Pre-Degree Advising and Admissions makes all final determinations regarding eligibility, and we urge you to confirm yours prior to taking courses. Other requirements include our online test of critical reading and writing skills, which is a prerequisite for the pro seminar, a required course for admission. Students are allowed two attempts at this test, and if they do not pass, they must complete the alternative expository writing course to meet the prerequisite for the pro seminar. For the fields of history, international relations, and government, this course is Expo 42B, Writing in the Social Sciences. This information is listed on the degree requirements page specific to your chosen field of study. Uh, I recommend attempting this test early so that you do not have trouble registering for the pro seminar and so you can know whether that expository writing course will be required. And lastly, in, a, in addition to earning grades of B or higher in your admission courses, you will need to maintain a minimum GPA of 3.0 in all degree applicable courses to be admitted. So for example, if you complete the International Security Graduate Certificate first, and then take the pro seminar for admission, all five courses will be counted in your GPA calculation. All right, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, for those interested in our graduate deg degree program, I recommend utilizing our admissions advising resources. Uh, these include individual advising appointments, which are open to students who have completed a course or are registered in their first course at HES. Uh, individual appointments are the best option for discussing concerns regarding eligibility or your specific course records. Uh, for more general questions, we have weekly open office hours by Zoom. Uh, each session is an hour long and you can pop in at any time during that period to ask your questions, or you can join and listen to the questions other students are asking. Uh, the Office of Pre-Degree Advising and Admissions hosts information sessions on specific topics each year, such as our uh, on our application process. These sessions will be advertised on our virtual office hours website. Uh, advisors can also answer questions by email at admissions at extension.harvard.edu. This is usually the quickest way to get answers to your questions about admission. And lastly, we do have informational videos on our admission process and our specific degree fields, which are totally worth reviewing. Uh, all of the above can be accessed from our admissions advising webpage, which we will link to in a moment. All right, now I'm, I'm going to hand the floor back to Leslie. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, as Allison just mentioned, we will have links um, available to all the resources that have been talked about today, and we'll be sending out the slide deck as well as recording in the next couple of days. So uh, watch for that. Uh, we do have time for a couple of quick questions. And what we did is 
is asked all of you to submit questions when you were signing up for the event. And so I've captured those. I'm gonna raise a couple of those for our panelists to um, address. And the first one is um, really talking a little bit more about um, the balance of online and on campus courses. Um, can this, any of these degree programs be completed solely online? Or do people have to come to class on campus? Stephen, you want to take this one? Yes, absolutely. I'm glad to, to speak to this. So uh, we do have uh, an on-campus component for the degree experience. If you wish to become a degree candidate and pursue the awarding of the ALM degree, which is different from what everyone might be doing, right? We have certificate people, we have people just taking classes, that's a different category. But if you are seeking the degree, then you do need to be mindful of the, uh, the on-campus component. I talked earlier about the various ways that that component can be met, either through a fall or spring course that meets weekly, or through the uh, taking of a three-week January session, three-week summer session, or seven-week summer session. We also offer uh, a number of uh, interactive weekend courses. All of these are different ways to meet the on-campus requirement. What I suggest uh, with regard to not only the on-campus experience, uh, but the various degree components that you need to meet, so everyone needs to take a seminar in their field that's not readily identifiable just by scrolling through a list. So what I uh, suggest that you do, in addition to my earlier suggestion of being in touch with your admissions counselor and your academic advisor on a regular basis, is that when you are searching for courses, scroll down on the left sidebar until you see the filter, the search filter that says courses in a graduate degree and then select the degree that you're interested in pursuing. And it will tell you what degree requirements are met by the courses that you're looking at. And as you're looking at the various factors that need to be completed uh, to achieve the awarding of the degree, this tool will help you rather than you just going in and clicking, I wanna see all government classes or I wanna see all history classes. You need to scroll down and find the courses in a graduate degree, select your field of study and then it will guide you through the way that you can pick courses to meet various degree requirements. Thank you, Dr. Shoemaker. Uh, one more question is about um, kind of the, the, the support that is here for students as they navigate the program and choose courses. There's such a wide selection. How do people get the support they need to choose the right courses that are right for their career and learning goals. So I'll jump in on that one as well. Uh, we've got Allison with us here today who you've already heard from. Uh, she is advocating for your connection with the um, Office of Admissions and your admissions advisor. Very important as you're coming up to the point of applying for admission, as she uh, suggested, reach out to them early to determine your uh, eligibility, that you're meeting the requirements. You don't want to get three classes in and discover, whoops, I don't have a regionally accredited degree that meets requirements, et cetera, or I have a duplicate degree that's too close. Again, figure that out early rather than late. Once you're admitted to candidacy, then you would be handed to an academic advisor who will help you to calculate the ways in which you'll meet the degree requirements, either through the capstone or through the thesis, the courses that you need to take, et cetera. When we have students who hit a problem uh, getting near what they assume is going to be their graduation, uh, but they find that there's a problem that's developed, it's typically because they did not connect with their academic advisor, who would have pointed out uh, the issue coming on the radar that needed to be addressed or handled. So frequent communication with your uh, admissions advisor, your academic advisor are very important. And then if you choose a thesis process, your research advisor will be key uh, in shaping your topic and preparing you to work for nine to 12 months with your uh, faculty member who oversee the production of the actual thesis. Great, thank you. Okay, we're really close to time here. So I'd like to move along and just close out with a couple more details. 
Um, I know that there were a couple questions in chat and we'll make sure that we include links to pages. Like there's a question about the public leadership credential. We'll make sure we have a link to that page so that you can read it thoroughly. We'll enlist some, um, some contact information as well. As well. Um, I just wanted to go over quickly that we do have three annual enrollment cycles every year. So there is a traditional fall and spring semester at Harvard Extension School, as well as an intensive three-week January session. And those courses, the new courses for each of those academic years are typically posted in early June. So keep an eye out for the new listing coming in early summer. We also have summer school courses through Harvard Summer School, which is part of the Harvard Division of Continuing Education along with Harvard Extension School. Um, those courses are posted every January and registration for the summer opens March 1st. Registration for the fall term opens in mid-July and registration for spring and January opens in early November. And every year ahead of each term, we host webinars that walk you through the enrollment process. So if that's something um, that you're interested in, keep an eye out and we'll definitely um, have additional information for you about how to start. Um, and then just the last slide, we wanted to list some contact information because um, I know that we provided a wealth of information here for you today, um, but you probably have more questions that are really unique to your own individual experience. Um, here are a couple of good contacts. Enrollment services is really your first stop. They know a lot of information about how to get you started, about prerequisites, about enrollment requirements, and to set you on the path to be successful. So that is a great place to start. If you have admission-specific questions, as Allison has mentioned, um, her group offers virtual office hours on a regular basis. Um, the schedule is linked from this website. Um, and they're also accessible via email address here, admissions at extension.harvard.edu. All of the people on these teams are really eager to talk to you and to answer questions. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We're here to support you in your decision. And I just wanna say thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to be with you for a little bit. We will follow up in the next couple of days with the recording of this webinar, with the slides, with some links to help you. And we just wish you a really nice day. Thank you so much.